is two o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Welcome to the Texas Children and Nature Network webinar, Schools That Heal, Design with Mental Health in Mind. My name is Sarah Coles. I am the Executive Director of the Texas Children and Nature Network, and we are excited to have you with us today. We are recording our session today, so thank you for joining us. To save bandwidth for all of our attend attendees and for a clean recording, we ask everyone to turn off their cameras and mute themselves during the presentation. I will be monitoring the chat so you can share your questions there and I'll share them with our presenter. Amanda McMickle is running tech for us today. Thank you, Amanda. As I said, we're recording today's session. Alice will share uh, the link to this session in a follow-up email in the coming days. If you're uncomfortable with your name showing, you can change your name to anonymous and then private message Amanda with your name for our attendance. Also, if your Zoom name does not match the name you registered with, please change your name or let Amanda know. If you're in need of a certificate and we do not have your name, uh, we are not able to provide that certificate. And also just a reminder, if you are needing a certificate for your attendance, uh, you will need to email myself, uh, and the email is in the Zoom link email um, after the workshop uh, to get that certificate. I'm going to go ahead and do our land acknowledgement. Texas Children and Nature Network is headquartered in Austin and as such is on the ancestral and unceded land of the Tonkawa, Comanche, and Sana people. Our ongoing colonial presence on indigenous lands compels us to take action now to counteract the effects of colonization. The work we do through the Texas Children and Nature Network is one small step towards that effort. I'm going to put a few links in the chat in just a moment about land acknowledgements and about those people groups. And now I would like to welcome our speaker today. Today, Claire Latain is with Cal Poly Paloma, and she is the author of the book Schools That Heal that you can see on your screen here. And we are excited to hear her presentation today. Thank you for joining us, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Claire Latine, and I'm joining you today from Los Angeles, where I've lived for the last 18 years, actually 20. Time is getting away from me. Um, but I'm from the East Coast. I grew up in Ohio in the Midwest and spent a third of my life in North Carolina in the Southeast and have family from New York. Um, so a lot of these strategies that we're going to share today are relevant to anywhere. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of context to talk about why we need to design with mental health in mind. And then I'm going to share some specific strategies and for design, as well as funding and communication, and then give some time at the end for questions and answers. So I'll try to keep an eye on the chat if you have questions that come during the presentation, feel free to add them in the chat. And if I don't answer them in, in live time, then Sarah will take us through um, Q&A at the end. So today's generation of youth is largely defined by eco-anxiety, fear of school and neighborhood violence, a global pandemic, and social uprisings against systemic racism. They struggle with unprecedented levels of anxiety and stress and depression. In fact, our children and youth are in crisis. In 2021, 44% of high school students had experienced persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. More than half of female students and 76% or three out of four LGBTQ plus youth reported persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. At about 20% or one of five high school students had seriously considered attempted, attempting suicide during the past year. This includes more than one in four female students and nearly half of LGBTQ plus youth. And while there has been major effort to increase the number of counselors and psychologists in schools, it would take an incredible amount of resources to treat every student individually. Over half of students with mental health issues are never diagnosed. And even if they are diagnosed, 60% diagnosed with major depression do not receive mental health treatment. 
And what about our teachers? In a RAND research study, teachers reported nearly double the rates of job-related stress and nearly triple the rates of depression than other U.S. adults. When asked if they were considering leaving their jobs in January of 2021, 17% of adults said yes, and 23% or nearly one in four teachers considered leaving. Half of Black teachers considered leaving their jobs. Studies have found that all students, but especially students of color, benefit from having teachers of color. And Black students in particular benefit from having teachers of the same race. Our school's physical environments are not helping. The most common descriptor I hear from students and teachers about their school is that they look and feel like prisons. Campuses that were once designed and planned with open and welcoming entries, large and operable windows, generous lawns and large gardens have been slowly eroded by pressures of school population growth, auto-centric planning, concern for security and shrinking maintenance budgets. As we grapple with how to improve um, in social justice and environmental justice, address rising temperatures and drought and stormwater and how to keep our schools open safely in a pandemic age, school design with mental health in mind provides some strong solutions. We can support all of these initiatives by designing schools to become environmental and social safety nets for all students, families, and communities who use them. A groundbreaking 1980s study by Roger Ulrich found that hospital patients recover faster and request less pain medication when their rooms have views of trees. This work launched a movement of therapeutic gardens and healthcare environments, but there was no parallel initiative to design schools with mental health and healing in mind. And it's time that we start that movement. Being here today, you are starting that movement. We can design schools that boost the immune system, improve academic outcomes, help heal trauma, reduce stress and anxiety, increase the sense of safety, and improve environmental health and climate resilience. We can design schools that heal. 50 years of research shows that viewing and being in nature calms our breath, reduces our heart rates, stress, and anxiety, and brings communities together. And nature is especially helpful for people experiencing trauma. I've found three main design principles that support students' mental health and well being. These are to create environments that nurture a sense of belonging provide natureful places, and inspire awe, curiosity, or wonder. I'll share some examples of each one. If we apply these principles at a whole school district or city or county or watershed scale, we can improve public health and resilience to climate change and environmental justice by reversing the uneven access to parks, trees, and gardens, and providing the multiple social and environmental benefits they bring. Cleaner air, water, and soil, stronger communities, green jobs, and career technical education opportunities, and restorative environments where students can regain calm and dream of their own future. Because schools are spread out evenly distributed through our neighborhoods, and where children spend 15% of their lifetimes and the majority of their waking hours, making them the ideal place to become living, vibrant community resources. The potential impact is significant. This is a map of schools in Los Angeles County. In California alone, over 10,000 public schools serve 6 million students on 130 thousand acres of public land, and I'm sure the numbers for Texas are even greater. I'm going to share some specific design strategies for each of the three principles. So starting with nurturing a sense of belonging. First, we need to include students and teachers in the design process, the planning and design process, because despite the fact that students and teachers have the most at stake from their school design, they're largely largely left out of designing their schools. 
the simple act of asking them what they experience and need at school gives us important insights into how schools are used and perceived. <clears throat> Next, we need to create welcoming entry and edges to the school. This helps students and their families and communities feel connected to their campus. This is the same school um, right when it was opened in the 1920s. And then again, when it was redesigned um, to do a re earthquake retrofit in the 1970s, which entrance feels more inviting? And what message are we sending to our students and communities with these designs? Front entrances facing the street without gates and fences convey a sense of welcome and certainty to visitors, students, and the greater community. We can honor students' lived experiences and histories. This could mean showcasing art or growing and serving food that reflects students' cultures or traditions, like this joint use community garden at Fremont High School, which invites community members in to work with students, harvest vegetables and fruits and host community events, like free farmers markets, garden workshops and community meals. And this garden is um, part of a new community school model at this school, which includes a wellness center that provides health care, mental health, physical health, and dental health care to students and community members. Honoring students' lived experiences also means understanding that not all students learn best by reading or through lectures. This physics garden at Pomona College allows students to feel and experience the physical forces they're learning about. It lets children with learning differences feel successful as students and lets teachers see students in a variety of learning landscapes. Because learning outside changes how teachers see students and how students see themselves. In her 2019 Landscape Architecture Master's thesis, Lisa Strong asked 19 teachers to, to participate in an outdoor learning intervention. The intervention involved teaching a 30 minute session outdoors twice a week for 12 weeks in an elementary school. Before the study, she asked teachers whether they thought about outdoor, that outdoor learning could engage students academically. Three quarters said yes, 22% said sometimes. But when asked about struggling students, only half of teachers thought outdoor learning could engage students academically. After the intervention, 100% of teachers thought that all students, including struggling students, could be engaged academically with outdoor learning. Strong also asked teachers how struggling students face setbacks. Before the intervention, 100% thought struggling students gave up too quickly. After teaching outdoors for just 12 weeks, 60% of the teachers answered that struggling students bounced back when faced with setbacks, and 40% answered that students work harder. This striking shift in perception lasted after the intervention ended. After returning to the classroom, three quarters of teachers answered that struggling set students bounced back when faced with setbacks and noticed that no teachers thought they grew, gave up too quickly after teaching outdoors twice a week for 12 weeks. The students did not change. Their learning practices did. <clears throat> We need to think differently and deeply about accessibility. Our codes and policies put hyper-focus on mobility without addressing the different needs of students who have developmental, sensory integration, or invisible, phys invisible physical disabilities that would benefit from a variety of natural surfaces, textures, and social and play opportunities. Even for disabilities that limit mobility, occupational therapists and special education teachers emphasize the importance of getting students into natural settings and engaging natural materials. There is also a problem with play structures made with petroleum products like plastic and rubber recycled safety services. 
These materials get dangerously hot in the sun, fail to provide creative play and exploration, are toxic to the environment and to children, and far more expensive than nature-based play materials. We need to create cozy places and quiet spaces. Again and again, teachers and students of all ages ask for quiet places where they can go to de-stress. And this is the most rare environment found on school campuses. Small spaces away from activity and ideally in or with views of nature can provide respite as well as places to hold community circles for restorative justice where students and teachers can go talk and repair their relationships with each other, themselves and the world. We also need to provide enough seating. Too many schools have a shortage of the simplest seating opportunities in lunch areas or gathering areas. And scarcity of seating or anything else creates competition and hierarchy. Um, this is a lunch time at Eagle Rock High School in my neighborhood where the seating available for students during lunch was about 250 seats for over 2,400 students. And they have just 30 minutes to line up, get their lunch, find a place to sit, eat their lunch, put it away and go to class. We can push this further by providing places where students can rest and recuperate and lie down and relax. Research shows that swinging, rocking, and even walking brings us back into our bodies and restores a sense of calm. Hammock groves like this one are popping up in parks and college campuses across the country. Why not schools? Imagine teachers being able to use this kind of restful place. Because people of all ages, from the smallest child to the grandmothers you see here, find comfort in swinging and rocking. The next principle is to provide nature-filled environments. We can design with nature and with natural systems to create comfortable indoor and outdoor environments with less need for energy. Design buildings and classrooms to block the summer sun and bring in the warming winter sun and to allow natural breezes to cool and ventilate interior spaces. Design the landscape so that rainwater from roofs and pavement flows into planting areas to encourage deep roots and to recharge groundwater tables. Work with land management teams and maintenance teams to let plants grow to their natural height and form and maintain their flowers so that wildlife can benefit from them and to let leaves and grasses stay on the ground to decompose and become new soil. This also can reduce the noise and air pollution and energy use from landscape machinery, which if, it, if your campus is anything like my campus is often going off right next to classrooms during class and making it really hard to concentrate, especially so for those students and teachers recovering from trauma. We can support students' feelings of safety through design. Ten Rodney Matsuoka's University of Michigan doctoral study correlated environmental attributes in 100 Michigan high schools with student behavior and educational success. And he found that larger classroom windows and higher human activity levels on, on the street in front of schools associated with less student crime, while an open campus policy allowing students to leave freely for lunch and natural features next to school buildings associated with more students planning to go to four-year colleges. Wide open views, even if they were of living grass, related to more student crime and fewer students planning to go to college. Matsuoka's study found that big open areas like this make students feel less crime and correlate with more student crime, sorry, make students feel less safe and correlate with more student crime and disorderly conduct. 
We could place trees strategically, like shown here in this illustration, where students can benefit from them while eating lunch outside, if that happens in your school, and provide plenty of shade where students eat and congregate, and also while also breaking up those big spaces. Um, this campus is similar to most high schools. Existing trees are, were, were concentrated around the perimeter in a few key areas. Um, and just a, a recent research study on the urban heat island effect found that when about 40% or 50% of a block or a campus is covered with tree canopy is when you start to see a real reduction in urban temperatures, which reduces the risk of heat related illness, reduces the amount of water needed to keep landscapes alive, cools and comforts the campus and the students, we can plant more trees wherever students are spending time or can spend time and where students can see them from their classroom and cafeteria windows because views of trees from inside helps reduce stress during and after tests and boosts academic performance. <clears throat> Of course, this is only effective if we work with teachers and administrators to uncover windows because the myth is very much still alive that all eyes and attention in the classroom needs to be on the teacher. In fact, students need and deserve visual access to trees and gardens to restore attention and reduce stress so that they can learn. And when you have a daydream or looking out the window as I did during most of my pandemic teacher teaching, what that student is actually doing is um, listening to what their body and their mind needs in order to be able to learn. <laughs> we can provide natural experiences for experiential learning. The Campbell Elementary School Wetland Lab shown here in Washington DC took advantage of previously soggy grounds, flooded grounds to recreate a wetland habitat for their children to explore and learn from. A lot of our schools are built on previous streams or swamps or wetlands, probably because the land was cheap at the time. And that provides a challenge for flooding and other issues, but it can be turned into a learning opportunity. Children also need places where they can test their balance, their strength and their agility. Um, the International School Grounds Alliance, whose leadership represents 38 organizations from 16 countries and six continents, released a risk in play and learning declaration in 2017. They say instead of designing school grounds to be as safe as possible, they ask that we design them to be as safe as necessary so that children of all ages can explore what their bodies will allow them to do. This uh, climbing wall in Berlin was made with students, led by a local stone carver with local sandstone to reflect the context, the environment, and give learning opportunities as well as play opportunities which is a good lead in to our last principle, inspire awe, curiosity, and wonder. Our students need and deserve a world full of wonder and intrigue, a school site that engages their curiosity and sparks the imagination, a place where they want to be. Beauty, warmth, war wonder, and awe improve mental health and well-being. Awe makes us feel humble, small, and insignificant in a way that makes us feel connected to the world around us. Dr. Keltner's study of awe has found that awe-inspiring experiences like nature, artworks, music, and shared experiences improve our mental health and bring us together as a community. Most common in Dr.'s study were nature, music, visual design and moral beauty, such as when we witness people helping each other. Less common, but often more profound were collective effervescence, the feeling of um, fans madly cheering together in a soccer stadium, for instance, or spiritual experiences, epiphanies, like when we learn something unexpe 
unexpected that changes our worldview. And of course, um, births and deaths, life's beginnings and endings. From public art that speaks different narratives to each individual, to discovering small creatures like these. Um, during moments of stress or anxiety, these special places and moments become anchors to hold on to. It allows student, students to develop an attachment to place that improves their mental health and strengthen, strengthens their sense of community and belonging. Students whose curiosity is sparked, who are inspired, awed, or simply comfortable are more likely to show up ready to learn. These three principles nurture a sense of belonging, provide nature full places, and inspire awe can help us design school environments that nourish and nurture our students and teachers, give them places for respite and places to be whole. The physical design of our schools can improve the lives of the hundreds or thousands of children and teenagers that attend each day and support the teachers and staff who are there to help them. If we apply these principles at the whole school district or city scale, we can improve public health, environmental justice, and resilience to climate change by reversing those injustices that are present in our systems. One of the biggest hurdles towards transforming school campuses is communication. We're trying to shift perceptions priorities and practices formed over more than a century of industrialized school design. Our language, whether we are teachers, designers, administrators, or counselors is full of code words. How are we supposed to transform school environments if we don't understand the person we're trying to convince or if they don't understand us? We need to meet people where they are. And just simply put, um, hmm, can you guys still see me? Okay, simply put, this means engaging students and listening to them, supporting parents as they try to navigate the complex systems to support their children, educating designers, many of whom are completely unaware of this research or that they can advocate for students and teachers, teaching educators how physical learning environments impact students' learning and everyone's mental health and well-being, including their own, empathizing with administrators who must answer to everyone and worry about being sued, and partnering with government agencies who might have shared goals and resources like funding to improve school campuses for climate resilience or stormwater management. Another hurdle is how to pay for these improvements in the long term, especially for nature-based solutions like trees and gardens, which often bring up the issue of no funding for maintenance because money doesn't grow on trees, or does it? Schools that heal using nature-based systems and solutions can provide many benefits that save money in the short and long term. They reduce flooding and can increase local water supplies. They cool the air and surface temperatures by 20 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit, reducing energy spent on reducing money spent and energy spent on cooling and heat related illnesses. They reduce air pollution by as much as 60% and reduce the impact and money spent on improving um, health. They protect us from skin cancer and promote healing, increase safety and provide a greater sense of community, all of which save money on social services or health care or infrastructure. So here's an example of a strategy to take advantage of those benefits and connect, connect the dots between them. We could link finance streams to acknowledge that investing in one system might reduce costs in another system. In this case, the Nature Conservancy, the Trust for Public Land and Analysis Group diagrammed how investing money in planting more trees to increase the urban tree canopy can reduce health impacts from heat waves and air pollution 
while improving mental health and encouraging people to be more active, all of which will lead to better health outcomes, which saves money spent on individual treatment and aligns with the mission of health organizations. So why not work with those health organizations to help pay for and support urban forestry groups to plant and care for trees? Some strategies to support and or fund maintenance of new spaces or programs at schools might leverage those broad benefits to um, connect those new spaces and natural systems to attendance and enrollments because often most, most states determine, determine school funding um, through attendance and enrollment. We can put capital investments towards multi-benefit design strategies by connecting school transformation to mental health, physical health, and education benefits. You might be able to tap into funds set aside for those initiatives. We could provide professional development because often even when we put in um, trees and gardens and nature and views, Teachers don't take advantage of them or don't know how to use them or are intimidated um, by teaching outside. We can train, train teachers to teach outside. We can train landscape management teams to do less because climate appropriate landscapes designed with nature in mind needs less pruning, less mowing, less fertilizer and can save time, energy and water if the teams taking care of them know that. And we can meet city, county, state, and federal goals for stormwater management, energy efficiency, or climate resilience for potential funding support through grants or partnerships. We can also look outside of the district for funding. Um, often small, small grants can be available from businesses like Lowe's and Home Depot, both, both have $3,000 grants. Often, um, Neighborhood groups or other uh, chambers of commerce might be able to give small grants. There is a huge list of public and private grants available um, on the Texas Children and Nature Network website. Sarah or somebody could put the, that link in the chat for those of you who haven't seen that. And then um, even private philanthropy or partnerships with local county and state government agencies or nonprofits. Um, sometimes a state or county or local agency or a nonprofit partner can take the lead on writing a grant proposal so that the school um, doesn't have to do that legwork and administration themselves. And finally, nine reasons why I actually open the book with a chapter on nine reasons why we should design schools with mental health in mind. And these can provide some talking points to your audiences, but just really are given to connect all the dots. Um, children need healthy environments to develop healthy nervous systems. That's a really simple takeaway, but often overlooked. Mentally healthy design supports public health and works towards justice. Designing with empathy for students and teachers, not fear, increases students' sense of belonging and safety. Design can amplify existing programs for restorative justice and mental health. We can boost boosting students' immune systems and physical ability with nature play increases long-term health well into old age and physical safety, as well as mental health and well-being. Ecological literacy helps students thrive in school and gives them a sense of optimism and purpose, something that they're really needing right now. Nature-based and community-led design nurtures teachers too, and our teachers very much need that support right now including students and teachers in an inclusive, collaborative, multidisciplinary design process, not only helps them feel heard and valued, but it can also introduce them to disciplines 
that they might not have heard of before, like design and planning, landscape architecture, architecture, civil engineering. And finally, a community-led nature-based design approach can support social justice and address social determinants for health. And last, I want to end with just sharing a, um, a discount code for Island Press. If you go to the Island Press website and look up Schools That Heal, you can get a 20% discount by putting my last name in Latin A into the discount code box. And I'd love to open up to any questions or conversation um, that you all have. We can do that in the chat, but we can also do that with people raising their hands. I'm happy to do this however you feel comfortable with, Sarah. Well, we've Thank got you. a question in the chat to get us started um, from Alice. What is a school project that you have worked on that had the most impactful success story for the students and the teachers? That's a really good question. And actually, I have um, some slides to talk about this because I wasn't sure how long I would be going today. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to Eagle Rock Elementary School, which is where this work started for me. Um, Eagle Rock Elementary School, this is what it looked like in the 1920s, shortly after it opened. It was designed after, like a lot of schools, after the 1918 Spanish flu and tuberculosis pandemic. Um, and this is what schools were built were designed like in the 1920s. Generous windows designed to tilt in to allow airflow without blowing paper around inside the classroom. Um, this is the school that my, my children went to in the early 2000s. And it's the school that start, sparked my interest in the topic of school design with mental health in mind. Um, even though this building was retrofitted for earthquakes and stuccoed over. This is what it looked like uh, a few years ago. The original design intention is still there. It has high ceilings, wood floors and trims. You can see in the in that picture on the right, um, the hip to those that tilt in and, and actually some of the innovations in heating and cooling at the time were to put oversized steam radiators, you can see them circled here, under the windows so that the room could stay warm while the windows were open. I thought that was really interesting when I came across that. And then you can see out the window that there's a full canopy of trees. This is the west side of the building. And so the tree canopy um, gives views of trees, but also keeps the building cooler during the hottest sun of the day and reduces energy needed for air conditioner, air conditioners. And even in the heat of the summers that we're experiencing now, these classrooms stay rel relatively cool in August. Um, this was what the school grounds looked like when uh, when my children first started attending school here. This is what the play yard looked like. This is what a lot of schools, elementary schools look like. I'm sure you've all seen similar environments. Um, in 2009, I taught a senior design studio at Cal Poly Pomona School as our site. Our students were learning about multi-purpose, nature-based design strategies, and my son's second grade teacher invited our students to teach her second and third graders how to read and draw maps and talk about watershed health. This is a really good example of a, a partnership between a university and a K through 12 school and one that we're continuing today, that I still do today. Um, as part of the exercise, our students asked the second and third graders to reimagine their schoolyard. And these are some examples. The 24 students drew what they wanted, all featuring variety and discovery and living things and little to no asphalt. Um, 
And then our students translated those student drawings into nature-based design concepts that would improve ecological and human health and well-being. They presented their work to a group of teachers, the principal and parents. And then a few, couple of years later, these parents wrote and applied for a uh, $350,000 state stormwater grant to remove the asphalt and replace it with low impact multi-benefit design elements. Um, this picture on the right is our, we're, the, we're, we're all collaborators. Dr. Marcy Rainey worked at um, Occidental College at the time as a behavioral health researcher. And she led her research students um, to analyze the school grounds and find out where students were active on the campus. They found, this is the design that ended up being implemented. This is what the school looks like today. Um, Dr. Rainey and her students found that the handball wall, walls and basketball courts were well used. So the design keeps those in place. Um, and that the center of campus where that funny shaped lawn and trees is now was really underused. So her research and observations allowed us to only transform the areas of campus that were underused. Um, we replaced 21,000 square feet of asphalt with a native learning garden, tree rows to shade the play yard, a large central park area, with shade trees and um, trees located in places where students could see them from their classrooms. This is what it looked like shortly after the installation. This was the new learning garden with native trees and plants and logs and seats arranged so that students could run around them in a circle, which is really popular. Uh, the trees planted to break up the large areas were already growing in. And even though you can see through the trees, like this little student here is walking in a space that actually feels surprisingly separate from and secluded from the main yard. A playscape. What do you mean by playscape? A play structure. There was an existing play structure. Um, I don't know about you all, but that existing play structure is more often than not taped off, even though it was relatively new. So um, they're usually there. We kept the existing play structure. We didn't remove it, but we added the logs and stumps, and we only had three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, so it wasn't very intricate the nature play that we provided. Um, this is a video that shows what this is what the schoolyard looked like before. Um, Marcy's students noticed that, you know, look, even in the active areas like handball, there are a lot of students that stand around and wait. Professor Pro, Principal Stephanie Leach is going to talk in a moment here. I hope you, you'll be able to hear it. Um, about what the transformation did for the students. Oh, I, I think I accidentally muted it. But the afterwards, they found the principal and the teachers reported the students were much more active um, and came into classroom into the classrooms after recess, ready to learn. They estimated that the teachers gained about 20 minutes of classroom time um, that they used to have to use to redirect students' attention after recess. They no longer had to do that. They were getting their energy out on this new schoolyard in a different way. Dr. Rainey and her students found that after the transformation, um, students spent more time in small groups in green in the green play areas than on the asphalt play areas which associated with more positive social interactions um, 
And antisocial interactions such as bullying decreased by 40 to 50% after the students were given time to adjust to the novelty of their new design. And physical activity went up significantly, especially for fifth graders and for girls, which are two, two groups that she was particularly concerned about um, the amount of physical activity. That's the age um, where students start setting habits with physical activity that last through their lifetime. Three years after planting the trees provide shade and grasses and sages were just big enough to give this feeling of being away, which is away from the rest of the area, which is, is really vital for mental health and invite the students to engage in a variety of activities and creative play. Um, Dr. Mar Dr. Rainey found that the more variety in the physical design of a schoolyard, the higher the number of students who are engaged in physical activity and positive social behavior. So that's the key takeaway. Rather than trying to emulate small spaces like this one, it, the important thing is that um, like all of us humans, sometimes we need a quiet space by ourselves to read a book. Sometimes we want to be at a big giant gathering or a concert um, or in the middle of the fray. Students really, really, really need that choice. So the more variety, the better in size, character, and everything of spaces. To answer your question, Alice. Are there other questions? Don't have any more in the chat. Um, I'll see if any more join. In this, in the meantime, I'll vamp for a second and remind everyone that summit tickets are on sale. So I will put that in the chat. Um, but um. I don't know, Claire, I don't know if you want That's to put funny. your your book up one more time. Oh, yeah, Colleen. and I mean, we maybe I could get a show Colleen. of hands. Colleen, did you have a question? Yes, um, I'm wondering how to kind of work with the, um, the demands that safety are presenting um, in public schools with, um, fencing and those sort of safety protocols that we have to follow and making sure that we can also create environments that don't feel like prisons for our students. And, you know, and have you run into that um, in schools you've worked with that have required security features um, that you can kind of work with and, and reduce that prison feeling? Yeah, so um, uh, I'm gonna go through the, another school for you, because you two are setting this up perfectly <laughs> to share case studies. Um, and this one is particularly relevant to that question, Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, who you all probably remember um, in 2012, it's been 11 years now, 20 children and six adults died at Sandy Hook Elementary School in one of the worst school shooting massacres in our history. And afterward, the Newtown School District shoveled, shuffled around some of their renovations um, in the district to rebuild Sandy Hook School first. This is a, a new school design. Um, the surviving students, teachers, staff, and their families and community really needed a new space to help them heal and move forward. So this is a good example of a school that was designed very, very much with security and safety at the forefront for obvious reasons. Um, you can see from the design that the school arches in a broad curve and that was meant to reach out to the community. That curve is um, symbolizes two arms outstretched to the community. The parking areas where, where students and families can enter in from. The 
the um, design of the front of the school was really intentional. There is a biofiltration swale that's kind of di uh, dips down um, right along the front of the school. And there are three entries that walk over for people to walk over that swale into the main entries of the school. And the offices along the front of that building are all the staff offices and administrative offices where people spend the most of their day in the office. So, so there's some, um, people are always can see who's coming into campus. It allows uh, natural surveillance. So even though it feels like this welcoming entry into, into campus, it allows um, the people inside school to see what's going on. The, the architecture team, Spiegel's and, and partners, um, facilitated the design process with a focus on deeply communicating with the community, deeply engaging the community. They selected 50 community advisors, 50, five, zero, to drive design decisions. And that included the security and safety team, um, parents, teachers, public health experts, mental health professionals, um, social workers, students. And they represented the interests of the entire community and really helped foster a holistic view of safety and wellness. Um, and it's, it's really poignant that this was the approach that the Sandy Hook School took, because as you know, as you're referring to, schools and districts around the country hardened their perimeters, added automatic gates, security cameras, and guards to watch the building. Sandy Hook Elementary took a completely different approach. They wanted the school to symbolize and embrace this is what a photo of the school. The advisory team wanted the school to be secure, and it is, but not at the cost of feeling safe. And since they couldn't find a single other school that had been designed specifically with this in mind, they drew from the research that I pre just presented um, to guide the design. They looked to the research on human behavior and feelings of safety. And so the new design is welcoming and warm and connects the school community to the healing qualities of nature. This is what the main lobby when you go into the school looks like. It's a central shared space, um, two stories opening to the ceiling. And, you know, Connecticut is a, a colder winter environment. So they really focused on bringing, the, bringing nature indoors through these large, two-story wall of windows. Morning sunlight streams through these windows, throwing blocks. You can see the blocks of color from the stained glass <clears throat> on the floor, soft furniture. Um, flocks of birds are represented in this ceiling structure art. The architects, cited the building close to the woods that were was already on site. This is on the same site as the previous school, but on, in a slightly different location. They, there was a wetland and woods at the edge of the school. They shifted the building closer so that um, every classroom window would have views of trees. This is an outdoor amphitheater that faces the woods and can act as an outdoor classroom or a gathering space. And then the ed each edge, there are three building wings, classroom wings, and each wing ends in a space like this. Um, there are natural materials through the, throughout the school. They drew on biophilic design. If you haven't heard of biophilic design, that's something worthwhile looking up. It draws from our natural connection to nature and the healing qualities of na nature to bring interior spaces closer to that natural feel. If you can't use natural materials like wood and cotton and natural fabrics, then you can also use natural patterns um, or art, you know, murals, paintings of nature. Here we have 
three small spaces that were designed to mimic a tree house where students or teachers can go to be alone or a small group of friends. Um, and then I want to show you, because we still have a little bit of time, unless I hear see a question come up, I'm going to show you one more. This is a middle school that is probably designed like uh, the majority of, of your schools in Texas. This school was built in 1954 during the big um, school building boom to accommodate the baby boom generation. So it is, it used the typical finger plan. It was called the finger plan because there are these small rows, one story rows of classrooms strung together along a central spine. There are a lot of different configurations. Um, and then they, the students walk outside under a shaded walkway. And these are, can be found across the whole country. Um, in 2015, Webster Middle School was selected as part of the California program to clean and capture urban runoff while educating students about watershed health. And um, I was part of the design team that got to work on this school. And we really wanted, while some schools were like taking all of that runoff and putting it into an underground cistern to use it as irrigation, we really wanted to change the places on campus where the students could really see it and benefit from it. So we looked at the courtyards between the classroom buildings and the main entry and an area along the field up here on the top left where um, run runoff was actually flooding, collecting and flooding and flooding into neighbors' yards. You can see that better here. Um, that was a super flooding area. Um, and then I'm going to show you pictures of these three spaces here. This is the soggy edge of the field before. It was just became this kind of marshy mess, inaccessible mess. And this is what it became after the improvements of biofiltration, kind of rain garden with native grasses and native trees um, where students could go hang out on the rocks. Then it becomes this learning space. This is the, an area outside of the classroom. It, I don't have a before picture, but it was just asphalt with small teeny tiny little tree wells sprinkled throughout. We added a concrete seat walls to provide plenty of seating, but also to provide um, protection of the rain gardens here so that the students didn't trample them quite as easily. Um, and then, this, this was what the courtyards between the classroom buildings looked like before, um, really underused. You can see the big windows here, typical of all schools that used to open up. Maybe this, this, um, the, this is a, the north side of the classroom windows. So they're really ideal to be open for, for natural daylight, but they're closed and graded and closed over and the new courtyards now become a rain garden with signs and trees and plants and that this attracts wildlife, attracts birds and butterflies. It lets students see the journey of rainwater, but also um, see an improvement in biodiversity and habitat. And we know that even hearing bird song helps our mental health and well-being watching and hearing birds. Um, the community engagement and environmental education was a key part of the program. The, the program was planned and implemented through a collaboration of nonprofit organizations working with the Los Angeles Unified School District. And so some of those organizations led the community outreach and environmental education. Um, and then the Council for Watershed Health provided technical assistance to the schools. And they're also training the school management team in organic and watershed friendly maintenance strategies. So I think this is a really good school to show that even our existing schools can make big transformation. It doesn't 
it doesn't necessarily address um, the school security question that you ask, Alice, although it is, um, you know, from Matsuoka's research, spaces like this, adding spaces like this, where there were previously only wide open spaces, improve student behavior. And for a school like this one, um, that can make a big difference in middle school and high school, especially. It also, a lot of these programs that are sponsored by the state are, re, they require amount of community engagement. So the more we engage community members in our school spaces, designing and planning, but also maintaining them or taking care of them or just coming to events, the more the community, the broader community feels a sense of belonging and welcome and will help take care of the school, not just physically, but also keeping eyes on it. Thank you, Claire. Um, I really appreciate all of your time today. We are right at three o'clock. Um, and if you would like to put your, your book up again, I know there's probably a bunch of people in here that would be interested. Um, there we go. Um, and then we have a comment in the chat. I think the new Sandy Hook Elementary case study is a great example to share with schools concerned with safety issues, um, which we are seeing in, in Texas this year. Uh, every school has to have a non-scalable fence. So we are we are definitely dealing with those issues here in Texas. Um, but yeah, thank you here so too. much. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, and uh, we will be sending out um, a follow-up email in the coming days with the recording link. Um, and so thank you everyone for joining us and have a fantastic rest of your afternoon.